you to our Conversations in Conflict today. I'm Catherine Girard, the Director of ARC, and uh, delighted to have you here. Our speaker today is uh, Dr. Peter T. Coleman, who is Associate Professor of Psychology and Education at Columbia University's Teacher College. He's also Director of the International Center for Cooperation and Conflict Resolution at Columbia, which is their bigger version of ARC. Um, and he also serves on a very uh, interesting interdisciplinary institute called the Earth Institute. Um, Dr. Uh, Coleman has uh, published widely in the area of uh, peace and conflict. Um, I'll just mention a couple of his publications because I want to get to what he's going to be talking about today. Um, some of you I know have seen the, the Handbook of Conflict Resolution. We have a number of copies of it in the Maxwell School. He is uh, one of the co-editors of that. Um, he also is co-editor of a guiding handbook for conflict resolution in the Arab world that some of you may be interested in. Um, but what he's going to be talking to us about today is his, um, his recent work. He'll be talking about this book, which you can all run out and buy if you're fascinated. Uh, it's called The 5% Finding Solutions to Seemingly Impossible Conflicts, where he offers some ideas and some tools for thinking about intractable conflicts. Um, we have got some copies of this article. So for those of you who are interested in reading a more theoretical version of, of uh, aspects of the book, um, it's called Rethinking Intractable Conflict, the Perspective of Dynamical Systems. We have some copies of, of the article there. Uh, I should also let you know that, that um, Dr. Coleman was gracious enough to let us tape this presentation, so we will be putting a copy on the website for those of you who would like to, to look at it again. Um, and, and finally, Dr. Coleman was gracious enough to agree to have pizza up in park with those of you who might want to speak to him or have questions in a, a bit of a more intimate setting. Um, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Peter Coleman. Thank you very much. So the, one of the great things about this book I'll share with you is that instead of textbooks that cost $80 and $120, $15 on Amazon. Um, so it's great to be here at Syracuse University. I've never been here before, um, but I've watched your basketball team uh, for many years. Uh, and I have to say, I, um, one of my heroes is here, Lou Kreisberg, who has worked in the area of conflict and peace and intractable conflict in particular for uh, much of his career and whose work I steal as much from as possible at every turn. So it's, it's, uh, it's an honor to be here in your, in your world and to be talking with your students. So, so um, <clears throat> I'm gonna talk today about uh, this book, the contents of this book, and, and uh, this is really the culmination of work uh, of a team that I'll introduce you to. Um, of scholars, uh, which is a multidisciplinary team that um, had, came together probably about eight years ago. Uh, and it includes uh, Lanbri Ryshinska, who's a social psychologist, uh, Andrea Bartoli, who's an anthropologist, Larry Leibovich, who's the Dean of Mathematics and Natural Sciences. He's an astrophysicist. Uh, Andrzej Novak and Robin Balaker, who are complexity scientists uh, and social psychologists. And, and then Naira Musalam, who is an organizational social psychologist, uh, and Ula, who is a doctoral student of uh, Anjay's. This group was brought together to bring whatever insights um, that we could glean from the area of complexity science, which is applied mathematics, uh, particularly a, a, a subfield called dynamical systems theory, um, which is, again, complexity science is an eclectic field. This is one component. And they um, have applied their work to a variety of different both macro and micro problems. Um, but we came together to focus on conflict, particularly these kinds of more difficult intractable conflicts that I call the 5%. And I'll explain that in a second. Um, we came through a grant uh, by the uh, James S. McDonald Foundation uh, and then have taken full advantage of our doctoral students uh, for the past several years, too. So their work is uh, in this book as well. Um, 
So uh, I won't be able to get into a lot of specifics in the book today just because I don't want to bore you and I'd like you to buy and read the book, uh, but I want to give you just a taste of it. It is this kind of amalgam of psychology, complexity science, peace and conflict studies, so some of it will be familiar to you and some of it will probably make no sense, so it will probably confuse some of you and irritate some of you, but that's the point. The point is that these kinds of problems we think um, tend to be resistant to the typical types of diplomatic, mediation, constructive solutions that, uh, we, that are effective in most other conflicts. But these don't seem to respond the same way to them. So we've been trying to uh, ask people to suspend their disbelief and think differently about these kinds of problems. So uh, let's get right to it and, th and think about a, a conflict. I want to give you just a small case to think a little bit about. Um, and to maybe talk to somebody next to you about. But basically what I'd like you to try to uh, answer is um, if you could identify one thing about this conflict that uh, causes it to be, seem impossible to solve, causes it to be intractable, causes it to go on and on and on, what would that one thing be? So let's start with this one. Some of you are familiar with it. <clears throat> um, and ask the, the question, why is this one intractable? Right, so the Israeli-Palestinian conflict um, is what I'm labeling it. Why do you think it's intractable? So maybe just take a minute and turn to somebody in, next to you and see if you can identify what you would see as the core to this problem of intractability in Israel-Palestine. Go ahead, take a minute, solve it, and then come back to me. <laughs> Okay, so what are your thoughts? What what strikes you as being uh, is as being critical, central to the the intractability of this problem? Yes. Sorry. So identity. It's rooted in people's identity, and therefore it's perhaps non-negotiable, or at least it takes a different approach. Okay. Any other thoughts? Yes. Okay, so religious disagreements, connections to truth and God, and those are also hard things to find uh, ways to negotiate around, perhaps. Yes? What I'm thinking is that Israel is looked like the 51st state of the United States. <laughs> okay, so it, there are deep investments of the United States in the future of Israel, yeah, and that contributes to the problem, yes. Any other thoughts? Yes. That, uh, the history of the conflict has been so long that it's almost institutionalized as kind of a way of being. Okay, so it really, ha it is part of the identity of, of many in the region. It has a history that is contested and complex, and it's hard to know even when the history started, right? Um, so, uh, so you're all right, I think, that all of these things are components to the nature of this problem. Um, some of them that have been identified are that it, some would argue it's at least a 100-year-old conflict that perhaps started uh, with the defeat of the Ottoman Empire by Western powers at the end of World War I. You know, arbitrary imposition of the international boundaries that took place at that time in the, in the area, international interests that continue, the history of the persecution of Jews eventuating in the Holocaust, uh, the creation of a Jewish state by the international community, long history of humiliation, displacement wars of Arab Palestinians by Israelis, competition over scarce territory, uh, zero-sum sense of competition, a win-lose sense of identity, uh, monotheists who sort of see their uh, competing for the prim primacy in the eyes of their God, many failed attempts by the international community to go in and mediate and broker peace through conferences and a variety of other things, which leads to a sense of, sort of peace fatigue, uh, oftentimes on the ground and with politicians. Lobbyist groups in America and Europe, spread of terrorism and concerns around that, socialization of entire generations, a commitment to the use of violence, obligations to revenge those who have been slain. These are all pieces that have been identified as central to the intractability of this problem. And of course, the pieces don't 
uh, list nicely like that, but they, they seem to relate to each other in this kind of complex way. They seem to feed each other in ways that are hard to understand uh, and start to create this sort of system of enmity uh, where hostility is the norm and is, is becomes an expectation uh, and therefore it's difficult to deal with any one or two or three components because they're all somehow related to one another, right? So these are the kinds of uh, issues that we deal with. Uh, it's best put, by the, 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 so the essence of the problem I think is best put by this member of a study that we did in 2002. Uh, um, she said that one of the things that frustrates me about this conflict, thinking about this conflict, is that people don't realize the complexity, how many stakeholders there are in there. I think there's a whole element to this con particular conflict to where you start the story, where you begin the narrative, and clearly it's whose perspective you tell it from. One of the things that's always struck me is that there are very compelling narratives in this conflict and all are true in as much as anything is true. I think complexities on many levels, geographic realities, relationships, different ethnic pockets. And I think it's fighting against a place where particularly in the US and American culture, we want to simplify. We want easy answers. We want to synthesize it down to something that people can wrap themselves around and take a side on. And sometimes I feel overwhelmed by this problem. And again, I, I, I really like the different aspects of intractability that are captured by this. The complexity, the various different perspectives, the competing truths, um, the need to try to find that you know, key essence of it so that we have some way to make a difference. Uh, and then the sense of just exhaustion uh, of, of, of dealing with a problem like this, right? Um, these are all uh, um, aspects of the experience of working with intractable conflict. So what I'll do today in attempting to kind of introduce you to this book is just talk a little bit about the problem as we see it uh, and then how we approach it. I'll touch on a couple of research studies and what it means for practice on the ground and then give you a couple of takeaways and we can go have pizza and talk, okay? Sound good? So uh, intractable conflicts defined by Lucrece Berg and others as these kinds of conflicts that endure, that are tend to be de destructive, they can increase and decrease in intensity over time, but they have a pretty stable destructive pattern and orientation, resistant usually to many good faith attempts to solve them. So if you look at the history of them, there are multiple attempts at mediation and other types of constructive approaches that seem to not have had an impact. Um, and they tend to spread. They tend to spread into uh, different aspects of people's lives, into the community. This is true whether it's with families uh, and an intractable conflict between, say, divorcing parents um, or it's at a more communal um, or national level. Um, they happen at all levels. You know, they happen in communities around pro-life, pro-choice issues. They happen uh, in businesses when, you know, individuals or departments get uh, into a bad dynamic and can't seem to get out of it and they uh, mostly uh, have been studied, though, in this domain. This is where we have most of the data to study these particular kinds of problems uh, over time. And so this is in places like Israel and Palestine and the Sudan and uh, the country Colombia and the war that's been protracted there, Northern Ireland, places like that. So um, I call this the 5%, and this is based on work by Paul Deal and Gary Getz, who has studied this thing called the Correlates of War database, which is this approximately 200-year database that looks at um, interstate exchanges, how states have traded and competed and um, had military exchanges with each other since 1816. And what they study is not like incidents of war, but they study how particular states get into rivalries. They get into sort of a competitive orientation. And some of them, approximately 5 to 8% of them, get stuck. They get stuck in a militaristic, competitive, contentious orientation um, that seems to be uh, intractable. These last um, approximately, on average, 36 years, sometimes is much longer, uh, but at least 20 to 25 years. So you see generations socialized into the conflict. Um, but again, it's only about 5%, which the good news is 95% of these kinds of, of international conflicts uh, are resolved constructively through some form, either through military unilateral victory by one side 
or through peace processes. The good news um, for those of you interested in negotiation is that actually the ratio of military victories to negotiated peace settlements has flipped since the Cold War. So it used to be that there were many more military victories um, and now there are many more uh, negotiations, negotiated peace settlements, um, so that the, the ratio has actually flipped since after the Cold War. So somebody's doing something right. The bad news is that about 25% of uh, conflicts that reach peace through a negotiated settlement relapse into violence within five years. And when that happens, the probability of them getting stuck for long periods of time increases exponentially. So it's when those things fail that they move into this more difficult and destructive dynamic. Okay, so they're only 5%, which again, to some degree is really good news, but um, they are responsible for about half of the wars uh, since 1816. So this five to 8% that endure uh, have been responsible for 49% of wars that have taken place since 1816, including the two world wars, which these uh, scholars believe were triggered out of these enduring rivalries. <clears throat> and about 76% of civil wars um, are the result of these long-term contentious rivalries between states. So they, they result in all types of um, militaristic um, uh, tragedies uh, and human suffering. So we've been trying to um, understand the essence. This is uh, Kurt Lewin who was I studied with a man named Morton Deutsch, uh, and he studied with this guy, and he was a German Jew that came to MIT eventually, um, and when he, he was a social psychologist, <clears throat> and he would always ask when his students were trying to study something that they didn't think they understood, you know, what is the essence? He'd ask what I asked you to start with. Can, you f can, can we understand the essence of this problem? So I spent the last, um, in a, starting in about 2000, I spent about two years looking at the literature, a lot of Lou's writings and others on these long-term intractable conflicts to see if I could identify what the literature said was the essence. And the good news is that I found it, identified the essence. The bad news is that um, there were 57 or so essences, <laughs> right? That depending on what perspective you saw the problem, it was, legacies of dominance and injustice that were, they were rooted in, or instability, so there was, the systems were unstable and there weren't regulatory mechanisms to control conflict. There were basic polarities that were non-negotiable and deep symbolism and ideology connected to these. Yes? Why is the conflict considered over? Because you can think of the American Civil War and some people thinking that it's still um, it's still alive. Yeah. yeah, well again, it depends on how you define conflict, right? So uh, in these situations, um, armed conflicts usually are 1,000 deaths a year, you know, so there, there are in some ways arbitrary definitions and distinctions of conflict. But um, so yes, it might be that hostilities continue to this day and regarding the Civil War. If you go into the South, you still may feel hostilities around those issues, but not open violence, not open conflict. Depends on how you define violence as well. Right, so to some degree this is arbitrary, but this group in particular has a particular definition for what you know, military engagement, competitive orientations and military engagement that persists for more than 20 years. That's how they define these kinds of intractable things. But it, again, to some degree it, it, it almost doesn't matter. What matters is these are conflicts that go on for too long, longer than they should, they cause great misery, and that it's extremely hard to find solutions to them. So it can be in a family, and it may not be lasting 100 years, but it lasts too long, and it results in misery throughout the system, right? Um, anyway, so there are all these essences that, I identif that we ident identified through the research. You know, they're relationships that are inescapable. So in a family, if people can divorce and go away, that's fine. But if they can't for some reason, like if they live in New York City and they can't afford another apartment, so they get divorced, but they can't move out, which there are a fair amount of. Um, you get stuck in this structure that you can't leave, either psychologically or physically. So a variety of these things have been identified. Uh, trauma has often been identified, that there have been past traumas yet with individuals uh, or with communities that hasn't been dealt with, and it's that trauma that politicians will stir up again and again, and that can be the source of these ongoing um, uh, antagonistic battles. 
Um, so um, we have these 57 essences, and to some degree, each one is correlated with intractability. So the, the stronger the sense of injustice, the stronger the, the, the more instability, the, um, excuse me, uh, issue centrality, all of these things are correlated with intractability, but they're also correlated with each other. So they tend to kind of move together, um, but they don't move together necessarily in a linear way like this, but they tend to cluster uh, in unpredictable ways and start to look something like this. So this is actually a mapping. Uh, there's been a ongoing conflict or a manifestation, I would say, of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict playing out on campuses uh, around the states uh, for the last 10 to 15 years. And this is one that has taken place in Columbia. Um, started with a documentary that was released by a group called the David Group, which is um, a pro-Israeli advocacy group. Um, and it outed some sense of bias by some students at the Malak Center at uh, Department at Columbia University. And it led to a series of dramatic and contentious um, events that unfolded over a period of two or three years, but that even today will become dormant and then one of the faculty will go up for tenure and then it, it comes back. So um, these, again, are uh, very complex systems that have a variety of events that feed each other and that lead oftentimes to high levels of escalation and de-escalation, but of course are very, very complex. So, Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, you, you just come in on one of these, which is, yeah. you've got on the bottom a temporal key, so that, yeah. uh, and yet the, this map is, is like spaghetti and meatballs. Yeah. Uh, if it's temporal, why not set it up so that it moves temporally, or do you want to imply that it folds back on itself in, in some way? Why not imply that it was, you mean, why not use right a Right now, you've got, all the, you've got phase one here, you've got phase four there, but they come back and forth. Yeah. And I'm wondering if that's meaningful since you Yeah, what's meaningful, again, so this is just a, a visualization or characterization of these various events as they unfolded over time and influenced one another, either through positive feedback or negative feedback. Um, so the characterization, this particular characterization, and there are a variety of different ways to do this, was done to say, well, there are these temporal phases uh, that unfold over time. Um, and so the things that take place in, in phase one, like the intensification of the intifada, which was the, back, the context for that, happen at more of a macro level. This happens at more of a micro level. But really, the point of these maps, and I can get back to this later, but the point of these maps are less about, are more about A, um, helping people deconstruct their understanding of the conflict so that they start to understand not just, well, the union's the problem, but they understand that actually there's a complex history here and there's a variety of different things that have fed this. And they have evolved and fed each other over time. And some of the things actually help de-escalate, ironically, but others will intensify the conflict, right? So it's the, this as a tool is really just a way for people to unpack them. Um, they're not ever, or they're rarely, uh, uh, characterizations of truth, right? They're subjective exercises that we put people through so that they can start to see the nuance, right? Okay, um, so there are a variety of different things that come together, um, but what is most characteristic of these complex, spreading, more and more pervasive conflicts is that as complex as they are, and as many different elements uh, that are feeding each other, ultimately they become seen as very simple. Right, that the, these variety of things are collapsed into you and your group are crazy, we're victims of your insanity, um, and it's pretty, and, 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 and that's the best we can do. And that's so when you live in these conflicts, that oftentimes is the experience. So that's what we've been trying to understand <clears throat> is that particular dynamic. When the nuance of a situation, a complicated situation, and a changing situation, starts to be seen as more and more simple and simplistic um, and, and, and therefore destructive and really close to new information. How does that happen and why does that happen? Okay. Um, okay. So, yes, yes, sir. Middle East countries, relationships, and United States relationships. Only two relationships? 
No, uh, good, good point. So um, I call this conflict, this illustration, the Israel-Palestinian -Palestin conflict. But it's, of course, a misnomer because this is a conflict that uh, there are many groups within Israel that are in conflict. There are many groups within the Palestinian community that are in conflict with each other. There are regional conflicts. There are international dimensions to this. So it is, at best, a multi-level, multinational, international conflict. Um, so it, 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 to call it Israel-Palestine is a misnomer. Um, but typically, that's how we refer to it, right? But I agree with you that even thinking about it in those terms is part of the problem, because it does oversimplify the dynamics, which are complex really at all levels. Okay. So one point I just want to stress is that what we think what, what Goetz and Diel, uh, Gertz and Paul Deal find is that these conflicts seem to be different. They seem to have, operate by a different set of rules, uh, and they are not responsive to um, good faith attempts to resolve them. What, there is some evidence that mediation um, um, perhaps makes them worse, at least doesn't make them better, right? The, the, best that they can, the best evidence they can find is that mediations may delay the onset of violence a little bit, but it's inevitable. So the tools that we have for diplomacy in these situations don't seem to help, right? So they're, they, they're different, and again, 95% of the problems that are faced, those tools work with, these don't. So somehow they're different. But I think that part of the problem is in our field, we don't understand that difference. We don't understand what, what is the difference in the dynamics. And so we contribute to the problem oftentimes by trying to solve it through the strategies that we have available to us. So one of the things I, I complain about in the, um, in the book are the, is the social science paradigm on which much of our work is based um, of conflicts in general, but the limitations of that paradigm and understanding these kinds of problems, right? So one I just suggest is that we think in straight lines. We think that X causes Y, that we think if we train people to be better problem solvers, to listen better, to ask more probing questions, that they'll be more effective mediators and that there's a linear relationship between those. And again, oftentimes that's true, but with problems of this nature, they don't operate in linear ways. They operate in very complex nonlinear ways or as Kevin Kelly says, uh, with complex systems, two plus two equals apples. So let me give you a, an illustration of this. This is a lily pond, right? Uh, and on a pond like this, um, you'll get these lily pads that will start to grow, right? And they grow in a certain way. Um, so this is what we know about these. Um, in a lily pond, 100% of the surface is t can be covered with lilies of the surface of the pond can be covered within 30 days, right? Surface area covered by lily pads doubles every day. So the question is, when is the pond half covered? And how much of the pond is covered by day 15? So this is, how, this is what we know, right? That 100% is covered in 30 days and that the surface area doubles uh, with lily pads every day. So um, how, how do we answer this question? When is the pond half covered? Yes. Pond is half covered on 29th day. Okay, pond is half covered in 29 days. That makes sense, right? Because then it would be completely covered in 30 days, yes. And what, at, at day 15, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to do, hard to do the math, yeah, it's not fair. Okay, so, right, so um, at day 15, uh, the coverage is 0 0.0025, right? Um, so at day 15, it's almost imperceptible. Um, and then it has this, um, what we call catastrophic change, right? So for long periods of time, um, even though it's doubling, you see very little change. And then suddenly you see radical change, right? This is a nonlinear process. This is very similar to what Deal and Gertz find with these intractable conflicts. What they one of the things that they find, one of the more interesting things that they discovered in their analysis of the database, is that if you look at these conflicts, the ones that last for 40 years plus, that um, typically 95% of them start, start within 10 years of some huge political shock, 
So the death, the assassination of a leader, uh, the end of the Cold War, um, some major coup in the, in, the, in the region, but some major political shock to the region takes place within 10 years, right? So something happens, like the end of the Cold War, and then 10 years later, something big happens, and what do we usually do? We say, well, what happened here? Something happened, what was going on here? Let's look at, it. Let's look at this. But it took 10 years for the destabilization of the shock to establish the conditions where this took place. So the Arab Spring happened, began to happen last spring, for example. What happened 10 years before that? So 20, 2011, last year. If you do the math, it's 9-11. 9, 11, 9 11. Right? Yeah. So 9-11 was 10 years earlier. The American incursions into Iraq and Afghanistan take place about the same time. And those are major political shocks in the region, in the Arab-speaking world, right? And then 10 years later, you see these regimes that had been stable for 30, 40 years overthrown, right? You see massive change take place. Now, is it true that 9-11 and the American incursions caused that to happen? Absolutely not. It's probably the world economic crisis, massive unemployment of young people, social network technology and the ability to communicate like that. You know, there's a lot of different things that affected the movement. But something they would, the, the data would suggest destabilized the region sufficiently that years later, the conditions are ripe for these movements to occur, okay? But it, thinking about these kinds of problems in this way is very different than how we usually think about them. Typically, our analysis will be in this region, you know, maybe a year or two before, but we don't really think about the nonlinear effects of change, okay? So, again, uh, the point I'm trying to make is that thinking in terms of cause and effect and, and thinking in, in the short term is often useful. It helps us understand some things, but it often misguides uh, us in terms of what the uh, more fundamental causes of such radical change are. Okay, another problem I have with our paradigm is that we focus on problems. I, I would guess that most of you study conflict, right? Uh, and war, and aggression, and hostilities, and we've done that very well for 80 years, systematic studies of conflict, violence, and war, and aggression. Um, but we don't study peace very much, right? We study peacekeeping out of war, we study peace processes out of war, we study those things, but it's rare that we study peace, right? Uh, do you know scholars that directly study peaceful societies? I know one. <laughs> a guy named Doug Fry, who's an anthropologist, you know Doug, right, who studies peaceful societies and has written quite a lot on that. But it's, it's pretty rare. We study problems. It's true in medicine, it's true in psychology. Psychology came out of the study of meth, uh, depression, anxiety, all the problems. And it's been in the last 20 years or so that psychologists and anthropologists have said, you know, we could study the good stuff, right? <laughs> So I could have said to you, well, why doesn't this conflict get worse? Or what provides a sense of hope here? There's a book by Gabriella Bloom, a Harvard law professor, called Islands of Agreement. And she studies these long-term conflicts like in Kashmir, and she identifies that in these long protracted conflicts like Israel-Palestine, you always have people doing constructive exchanges, trade, citizens exchanges, art exchanges, educational exchanges, even amidst dangerous times, there are people who are willing to talk and work across the divide who are there if you look for them, right? So these are islands of agreement that exist in this system, um, but what do we report on? What do we see is the violence and the animosity. We tend not to look at the existing solutions in the problem, right? All right, so that's another problem. Uh, um, a third is simplicity. So. There's a value in science called parsimony. We like the simplest possible solution, right? The simplest possible theory to understand phenomenon, particularly complex phenomenon. And that's a, a worthwhile endeavor. But as Shaw said, for every complex problem, there is a simple solution that is wrong. Um, so in response to that 
attempt to find the essence of problems, uh, the world of systems thinking and systems theory moved into trying to complexify our understanding and provide context for our understanding, right? And those models can tend to become very complex and can look like that. Have you seen this before? This is, um, this is a characterization uh, by the US Army of the Afghani government's attempt to uh, bolster its um, reputation in Afghanistan. And there are people in the US Army on the ground in war zones who create these PowerPoints every day um, to, un to help understand the context of the problem. And Stanley McChrystal, when he first went into Afghanistan, when he first went into theater, saw one of the th these things, said, when, um, when we understand this, we'll have won the war, <laughs> right? Because, you know, it's probably a fair characterization of events, but what do you do with this kind of information? So what we believe is that you basically need both. You need to know the forest and the trees, right? Or as Vaclav Havel said, simple answers which lie on this side of life's um, complexities are cheap. However, simple truths which exist beyond the complexity and are illuminated by it are worthy of a lifetime's commitment, right? So oftentimes quick solutions, simple answers, overly simplistic answers are part of the problem of how we analyze problems and respond. Um, and yet, if we can have some better, more accurate sense of the complexity and the dynamics that are unfolding in a situation, then we can perhaps identify patterns that are more constructive to work with. Because if we don't, we run into this problem. So do you know this book, The Logic of Failure? It's a book by a man named Dietrich Dorner, who's a German psychologist. It's out of print, but it's probably one of the best books in the last 30 years. Um, he's a psychologist that studies <clears throat> decision-making of leaders, like how they enter uh, an environment. So he cre creates all these great simulations like a West African village. And then he brings educated, well-intentioned people in the room, and he says, okay, you're the head of the World Health Organization and the World Bank. Make their life better. Right? Do whatever you need to do with all the itinerant problems of a West African village to increase the well-being of this community. Go. And what most people do is they go in and they read the situation and they say, okay, so what they need is a child vaccination program and a medical clinic and some doctors on, on staff, so let's put that in. And so what happens is the well-being increases, the population increases, uh, it spikes, they deplete the water table and everybody's dead in 20 years right? because they can't survive. So that's a typical solution. The solution is you identify what you see as the most salient problem, you solve it, and it has unintended consequences. The basic premise of his book is that he believes that there's more harm done by people like us who are well-intentioned and trying to do good things in the ground, but who aren't mindful of the unintended consequences of what we do, right? And not mindful of, the, of, of how we're affecting both the short and the long-term dynamics on the ground, right? So it's a cautionary tale, and it suggests that there has to be a way of, of addressing these problems that, it, that keeps us mindful of these unintended consequences. Yes? Okay. How am I doing on time? <laughs> I'm doing good, okay, I'm glad to hear I'm good, but what is it, like 15 minutes left, or ish? Well, about that, okay. Okay, so I suggest that what happens is that these are distinct conflicts, misunderstood, mishandled oftentimes, which leads to this kind of perfect storm uh, problem. So how do we uh, approach these kinds of problems? Um, so what I'm trying to, uh, what I wanna show you is uh, give you a taste of how these things start to be seen like this, right? How very complex, Red state, blue state conflicts with all the itinerant issues start to be seen in very simple terms. They're crazy and we're not, right? Um, and I want to give you a taste of it by asking you what you see here. Anybody see anything in this? Like a negative of a Mac, okay. Anybody else? 
There are faces. <laughs> Sorry? There are faces. Faces, okay. Where, what faces do you see? There is one man. There's a woman? There is a woman. Okay, woman where? <laughs> Sorry? What do you see? Yeah, it's like a woman stretching her arm. A woman stretching her arm? Yeah. Okay. What do you see, a man? Where do you see a man? On the right? Can you describe how you see a man? Oh, up here. Okay, right? Yes, okay. And the man. Anybody else? Okay. So this is an image called Gestalt Man. It supposedly is uh, a face that is sort of a Christ-like face or uh, Charles Manson, depending on how you see it, but sort of a bearded man right here. It might be easier to see there. At the top, there's a face of a man that's about the, the top half, and there's a chin and a mustache and a bridge of the nose, right? So here, here is a beard, and here is the mouth, and that's a bridge of a nose and two eyes, and it's a sharp, uh, a flash of light coming in at the side of the face here, but basically that's the face. Do we see it? You, you do see it? Who, see, who can see it? Four-ish, five, okay. Okay, so some people are beginning to see this face of this sort of, you know, Christ-like kind of image there up on the top, yes? Okay. Because I know you have to. You see it? Here. You get it over there now? Okay. Oh, okay. Okay, all right. Okay, now you can come up. So who, who can't see it? Okay. So my question is, how does that feel? How does it feel not to be able to see this man that other people say is there, and that I, the authority figure with the tie, said is really there? <laughs> oh, disorienting and confusing. What do you say? Disappointing. Disappointing, okay. Missing out, okay, yeah. Doesn't feel good, does it, right? Everybody's saying there's a reality there, and you're saying, ah, I don't see it, right? Yeah, okay. So this is a basic, fundamental psychological process, right, that we go through all the time. We, the world presents itself, and we gotta make sense of it. We need to make sense of it. It feels good when we do, and it feels terrible when we can't, right? Um, and it's, you know, from the Gestalt tradi tr tradition, when we see reality and can't make sense, there's a sense of te tension and dissonance. And, but when we finally see it, it's like, oh, there it is, right? It feels good. It's like finally it comes together. It's like why we like Hollywood endings, where finally they get together at the end. And, you know, we like that kind of closure, and, we, and it's, it doesn't feel good when we don't have that. Again, this is a, this is a basic process. It's what the work in cognitive dissonance says, that we don't, we don't like to act in ways that are inconsistent with our values, because then we just don't feel right. We prefer consistency. We like it when our friends like our friends, but don't like our enemies, because if we have a friend who likes our enemy, it just feels wrong, you know? Yeah? Does the theory say that we don't like that, and so we have a third alternative, which is to change our, the third element, which is, say, the story we tell about that? It's known, yeah. isn't it, as balance theory? And yeah, balance theory and consistency theories would say that the dissonance drives us to do something to make it fit. To eliminate the dissonance. Right? Yeah, to eliminate the dissonance, yeah. But it's still this basic need. There's still this basic drive to make things make sense, even if we change our behavior, change our attitude, whatever, right? Yes, okay? So again, it's this basic process, and part of what we argue is that it, it is a natural process where human, humans are generally driven towards this. There are individual differences. Some, of, some of, of us are much more comfortable with dissonant things and tension, and others really prefer that the world line up. Um, but conflict in particular, threat, conflict, pressure, intensifies that need for us to make sense. Um, and the more complex and threatening situations, the more we need to understand who's on our side and who's not on our side. Um, Sartre said that we were never so free as when the Nazis marched into Paris. Because when the Nazis marched into Paris, the world was clear, right? They're bad, we're good, there's no ambiguity here, it's simple. 
right? And there's something about that that is comforting when there's that kind of clarity, right? Ambiguity is much harder. What happens, we think, psychologically, socially, and even beyond at some point is that kind of need for closure, need for simplification can get stuck and become a closed system and then refuse new information, right? And this is oftentimes what you see in enemy dynamics is they're all evil, we're all good, and you can't really see any new information that tells you differently. You, di you discount it, right? And that's sort of the basic phenomenon that we believe takes place uh, in this crude law of coherence and conflict. So this is an idea that is pervasive in science. This idea that either very coherent, overly simplified systems or overwhelming complexity, neither is good, right? So we see this um, in physical sciences and we see it all the way into structural and institutional sciences. So let me give you a couple examples. I cover them all in the book. Physically, our heart rhythms are actually somewhat chaotic, right? Our heart rhythms are not orderly. They're, they have play and some randomness in them. And when our heart rhythms become very ordered, typically it's predicting cardiac arrest, right? It, it's, a, it's a prediction of illness. Same with, mental, uh, with brain waves, that our brain waves, particularly some of us, but, but many of our brain waves are complex and somewhat random, and when they become very patterned, it's typically before a seizure, right? So too much pattern, too much order is not necessarily good. There's a new book out by a, a psychi psychiatrist named Daniel Siegel who looks at the DSM-5, which is the new diagnostic manual in psychology of, of illnesses, mental illnesses. And what he did is looking through the, 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 um, the DSM-5, he finds that all pathologies in psychology and mental illness are either too much coherence, like obsession, compulsive, and focus, or disorganization, or flipping from one to the other, right? So that by default, what mental health is, which we don't really define, is something in between. It's having a sense of yourself that is structured and stable, but is open to change, is open to understanding, right? It's that in-between space, okay? So too much order or chaos is pathology. The, the in-between space is a more healthy mental functioning and social functioning. So let me skip to the macro level. There's a book by uh, Varshne who studied Hindu-Muslim conflict in India. Anybody familiar with this? Pardon me? Yes. <clears throat> and the book um, is a study of Hindu-Muslim violence there. He looked at a map of India and was interested in the fact that there were Muslim and Hindu communities near each other all over India, but there were certain places where the violence was most uh, atrocious, where these spikes of violence happened and recurred. And he was trying to understand what's the difference between this area and this area, and did ethnographic research and, and found that it had to do with the structures. Uh, and again, this is something that Levine and Campbell learned in the 1970s in studying um, different cultures. But what he found was that when you have um, cultures that are have what they call cross-cutting structures, have a lot of links, so that I am Muslim and I work, and you're Hindu and you know I work with your brother-in-law and I play soccer with your sister and I you know know your family for a while from the neighborhood. So we have these different bonds, right? So when a problem happens between our communities, it's hard for me to simplify you because I know your family, I know these people. It's very difficult to collapse that, right? But when there are communities that, of uh, Hindu and Muslim communities that live near each other but live in segmentary structures, right, where they sort of live in parallel, so Muslims work with Muslims, pray with Muslims, play with Muslims, et cetera, and Hindus as well, then when something happens between the communities, it's much easier to vilify and simplify, right? So it's the same idea. The idea that more complex or, um, structures of life where there's more interconnection between ethnic groups doesn't make violence and conflict stop,
but it mitigates it when it happens so that it's much harder for it to escalate into catastrophic violence, right? It's the same idea. It's the same idea of the value of more complexity um, in, in how we live and how we view each other. It's true in social identity complexity. What they find is if I ask in psychology, if I ask you what are the 10 most important groups that you belong to? And you say I'm university, I'm ethnic, I'm male, I'm whatever, you know, and you give me your list. What they find is that people left or right whose group identifications line up, so I'm green and I'm pro-choice and I'm progressive and I'm Democrat and I'm whatever, right? Those people are much less tolerant of outgroups than those of us that internalize contradictions, right? So I'm gay and I'm a Republican, right? I'm a social conservative, but I'm, you know, fiscally I'm not as conservative or the other way around, right? Those of us that hold internal contradictions like that and have a more complex sense of identity are much more tolerant of outgroups. So it's the same idea that when we oversimplify our sense of ourselves, our sense of the other, our community structures, um, you see the same kinds of potential pathologies exist, right? Oh boy. <clears throat> okay, so conflicts draw us here, and so the, the approach that we take is the need to understand how that collapse happens and understand how to mitigate it. So we've been working with, with mathematics. I, I won't have time to go into this, but we've been basically trying to model um, the phenomenon of the collapse of complexity and how systems become closed and self-organizing and to try to understand that at sort of a fundamental level. Um, and it's an idea that's called attractors. Um, and that's something that we go into in the book. It's just complex systems that evolve into very coherent states. This might be how I feel about an outgroup, right? A sense of really vindictiveness and hate. It might be how I perceive them in very simple terms. It might be how I behave towards them, right? Which is in very clear antagonistic ways. Um, what we find in our research, so we have, a, we have a laboratory at Columbia where we bring people in who have uh, um, uh, opposing views on a moral issue. So we would take a, do an opinion poll of this group, take the issue of pro-life, pro-choice, find people who are on either side of that issue and who strongly believe in it and bring them in the room together and say, have a conversation about this and see if you can reach some kind of consensus in your understanding, right? And what we find is if you run 100 dyads like that and you have 100 conversations, that about 25 of them end up like this, where people are enraged, they're shut down, they can't hear, they can't see, and we have to basically stop it. But there's another 25 or so of them that actually are able to feel a lot of different things, see the conflict with much more nuance, treat the other, you know, ask questions where they actually explore the other side, and walk away from the conversation saying, you know, I don't agree with what they said, but I learned some things, and I'd have that conversation again, and I think that was an interesting person, right? So they have a fundamentally different experience <clears throat> of what could be a very simplifying conflict. So what we see is these patterns of collapse versus these patterns of higher complexity that people experience psychologically, but that also, as you can see, exist in communities as well. So that's the basic idea. It's the idea of these patterns of attractors. These are patterns that we fall into psychologically or behaviorally all the time. Let me give you one illustration of an attractor, um, which is this one. So this is the uh, map, red state, blue state map of the election of 2000, right? This is how, this, how the voting fell that year. Blue states, you know that um, blue, um, blue voting happens within every state by water, but the blues are always by water. Uh, you know, w within Iowa, the blue voting, if you, t if you just look at the state of Iowa, within Iowa, the river counties are blue. I know because I actually went to high school in Dubuque. But the inland counties that are away from water are red. We can talk about this later. But the point I'm trying to make is, so look at this pattern in 2000, okay? This is the voting pattern that fell out in 2000, red state, blue state. Then what happened after 2000? 9-11 happens, the world changes. 
the radical changes that take place in the financial world, in the physical world, uh, and in terms of security, national security. And then what happens in 2004? Same people voted in the same way in the same places, despite this huge change that took place in those four years, right? That's an attractor. An attractor are, th are, are patterns that we fall into in terms of how we feel, how we think, how we vote, how we behave, that sometimes even go against our better th decisions, but it's just, they're patterns that we're drawn to repeat, right? And that's the construct from complexity science that we've focused on and that we've learned tomes from and that has implications for how we would address and work with these kinds of conflicts, how we would rupture them, how we would change them. So I uh, know that it's, we're sort of out of time. Um, so what should I do? <laughs> so I, won't, I, don't, I, I can't talk about the research in any detail because we will spend too much time. We do qualitative research where we study these long-term conflicts that flip into peace and find those very informative. We do uh, research, mathematical modeling research, where we take the basic essences of what we understand and we create computer algorithms and computer visualizations that show us how a community can coordinate into more hostile regions and how that intractability becomes more intense psychologically and socially, right? Um, and then I do a lot of laboratory research where we bring in these people and we measure their emotional and cognitive dynamics, yes? Ways to determine that this conflict is going to be intractable well, the only way that you can define a conflict as intractable is really by looking at its history, right? And looking at the fact that you've had this conflict, it might have been something that started from s s silliness, right? I once mediated a conflict, a community mediator for the New York State Criminal Association. Um, these were two neighbors, and the, the initial complaint was that paint, for, or, uh, sap from one of their trees fell on their car, <laughs> fell on the neighbor's car, and that was the conflict. But it escalated over a two-year period so that there was violence and arson and you know, it got worse and worse. So it started in, with something I perceived as pretty minor, but it grew and grew and grew because conflicts evolve. And it moved into this dynamic that was very hard to interrupt, right? So it's hard to know beforehand if something is going to move into intractability. Because the truth is, think of it. We deal with pro-life, pro-choice conflict in this country all the time. And it's rare that we see high levels of communal violence around this, right? People deal with moral differences, they deal with power differences, they deal with territory differences all the time in constructive ways. But some of them are these perfect storm conflicts that move into a dynamic that become very difficult to change. This happened in my family with uh, me and my wife's cousin. And it happened for years where we got into a thing where I couldn't abide to hear her voice on the answering machine and she felt the same about me. And it was a very difficult process and I, you know, I do, talk to myself, I'd say, I'm the conflict resolution guy. I gotta be able to work through this. And then I'd walk home and I'd see a, no, a letter from her to my wife and it would just piss me off. You know? And then I was right there. I'd get sucked right back into this pattern despite my best intentions and my attempts at being constructive, right? <laughs> The good news is we, did, we have had a rapprochement. I had to because when I wrote this book, I thought I have to talk to this woman. <laughs> you know, I, I cannot face you without having that. Anyway, so, um, so it, it, it's after one, and I think this. Well, do, do a little bit on the implications of thinking about attraction. Okay, let me, let me skip then to, um, if we can, just quickly, I'm going to go back to Israel Palestine. Yeah. Um, because. Uh, you know, what the book offers is a variety of principles, practices, tools that allow us to um, intervene and try to rupture these dynamics that are based on an understanding of complex systems and change. Um, this is what I want to go to. So again, if we think about Israel-Palestine, on one hand, it's an extremely complex, 100-year-old, multiple conflicts with people in places that it's always changing. You know, Arafat dies, policies change, prime ministers come and go, foreign ministers come and go, but the pattern 
is fairly stable. Intensification and deintensification, but deintensification, but the pattern is, is fairly stable. Um, and at some level, we could define it as a, a very tightly coupled, closed, self-organizing system where you have this kind of accumulation of negativity and dissipation of positivity, but you have these islands of agreement. You have these critical places that you, where you could intervene. So, um, so what the book goes into in much more detail is what does this mean for intervention? Well, the first thing it means is, the first critical thing is, you know, sort of back to your point, am I dealing with a complicated conflict or am I dealing with an intractable complex system? And what's the distinction? And our understanding of that at this point is crude. As I say, it's much easier to tell in retrospect that if you look at the history and you see there have been all of these attempts and they, and they just seem to make matters worse, it's probably a complex system, right? You may, you know, is, is Syria an intractable conflict? It's a horrible conflict. There's terrible violence there. Is it intractable? It's hard to say. I don't know if you would define that as intractable. Probably not yet, right? But it may move in that direction. It may stay in that direction. It may become a protracted civil war, and in which case, it, with, with many failed attempts. And then we would have to think about it in different terms, right? And not try to use the typical strategies. Um, the other critical thing to understand about intervention in complex systems is you can't make change happen. These are complex things. So you can't go in and do X and expect Y to happen because there are too many things that determine. The difference between a linear system and a, and a, a nonlinear system is this. A linear system is, say, if I take a ball or a rock and I kick it and I give some force and it follows a trajectory and it lands over there, sort of something of a linear relationship, more or less. If there's a big black dog here and I kick it, what happens? We don't know, right? It might eat me, it might run out, it might attack you, it might cower. It depends on a variety of different things. We can't predict what happens in complex systems when we introduce X. We don't know. What we can understand in complex systems is patterns. So if you have a 200-year database, like the Correlates of War database, you can see patterns that become stable, more and less stable. And so you can predict things over time. That's why our measures of these conflicts and of these interventions have to move away from kind of static cross sections to look at the dynamics over time, which is what we're doing more and more. So what you can't do is go in and make peace happen. But what you can do is affect probabilities. You can do things on the ground that increase the probabilities that more constructive dynamics would take place by having cross-cutting structures and sports clubs of inter-ethnic groups of kids. You can do things that will decrease the probabilities that more violence would happen, more destructive things, early warning systems, a variety of things like that. You can affect the probabilities, but it's not going to make peace happen, right? It's going to affect the probabilities, and in time, you might see the dynamic move into a more stable, constructive dynamic. But it, it requires that we think very differently about how our interventions work. Right? Yeah. Is it possible to find a solution to a conflict by identifying the starting point of the conflict, and then at the starting point, identifying the reasons, and then decomposing them into sub uh, simplified units, and finding solutions, and then arriving at this point in time, starting conflict. Well, again, um, the problem with that is, on the one hand, yes, on the one hand, no. If you look at Israel-Palestine, what's the starting point of the problem? It's hard to say. It depends on who you are. It depends on if you think of it in terms of the Ottoman Empire being overthrown and these arbitrary interventions that took place at that time, or if it's something that took place in 49, or if it's something that took place in 67. It's hard to know how to define the beginning. What is true about complex systems um, is that they're, they're, um, what we, the, the study of complex systems at all levels tells us that they're very sensitive to early conditions. So the, the first things that happen in a new school, in a new organization, in a new relationship are very determining of the trajectory of that relationship. So early things have an inordinate amount of influence in how systems will evolve over time. So to some degree, understanding the sources can be helpful. 
But the thing about conflicts is that they're dynamic. They're always changing. There are always more issues and problems, and typically it has nothing to do with what originally took place. It's how you've been treating me for the last two years, or you don't return my calls. That now becomes the issue. So there, it's always morphing, and therefore it's difficult to say, well, let's go back and solve that, because that may be irrelevant at this, at this point. So um, what I will conclude in saying is that um, what we suggest is that these kinds of 5% problems, long-term, very difficult, resistant to typical strategy problems, the small percentage of these require us to understand their dynamics differently, to not try to see them as typical strategies. It doesn't mean that many of the things that we do in terms of development, humanitarian aid, and even direct intervention can't have a constructive effect. It's just that we're not going to see the effects the way we think we would see the effects, right? It may take sometimes a decade or more to see the implications of our work. So it really requires us to understand how these systems unfold as best we can. Um, and to have much more modesty uh, and a much longer temporal scope in our understanding of the implications and effects of our, of our impact. Um, so there are many more kind of specific things that we recommend that you can do. There are papers we've written on all of these things and this, they're all summarized in the book. And maybe over pizza, I'm happy to talk about any of them. Like the power of the meek. The power of the meek is a really cool thing, right? So uh, Leyma Gabawi, anybody know who she is? She just, she's a current recipient of the Nobel Prize. Leyma is, um, she was a Liberian woman who was a mom. She was a mom with five kids. She was a young woman. And she lived through, you know, civil war after civil war and atrocity after atrocity and all of her, the lo local children getting sucked into this war. And she and a group of women at some point said, that's enough. I can't deal with this anymore. So they started to organize, and they took off all their jewelry and makeup, and they put on white t-shirts and headscarves, and they just stood on the side of the road, and they grew to a thousand, and they just said, we want to talk to Charles Taylor. And he would drive by them every day, month after month, and just ignore them until there were a thousand of them. And then he said, all right, I'll talk to one of them. And this group of powerless women had no authority had a huge impact on the peace process, on shepherding and guiding the peace process um, through negotiations and through implementation because they had what we call weak power, right? They didn't have authority, they didn't have wealth, they didn't have arms, they weren't a threat, and they made no sense. It didn't make, what they were doing wasn't part of the story of war. So they had this very constructive impact because they didn't have the trappings of power, right? Because if the, when the UN went in, in fact, UN peacekeepers would get stuck in a firefight with rebels, and they would call the women, and they'd say, help us. And the women would come in in their t-shirts, and they would sing, and they'd say, where are the women, and we're going to come in, and, and they would go into the bush, and they'd be in there for a couple of days, and they'd cook meals, and they'd hang out with these rebels, who, many of them who they were related to, and then they would bring them out, to the UN peacekeepers, right? So they could do things that the powerful, you know, armed men couldn't. That's the power of the meek in these systems. When you have conflicts that have a very strong, coherent narrative, where we know what the other side's gonna do and we know what we're supposed to do, that introducing more force into that doesn't help. But sometimes these surprising kind of serendipitous or weak interventions can rupture the system in unexpected ways. There are many stories of that. The story of Mozambique is similar to that. The rupture that took place in Mozambique was to some degree luck and a surprise and took, it came from a very weak source um, that helped the fissure grow and helped peace emerge in Mozambique. So I think I better stop, right? Because I think everybody's hungry. <laughs> Um, please buy the book and take a look at it if you really want to know how all these things work. Um, but hopefully you have a general sense of uh, the paradigm, the perspective that we take, uh, and I'd be happy to talk with you more about it.